Welcome to Equipping Hour. We do have handouts today. Um, Eliana has a pile of them and we'll be handing them out. So if you need one, just raise your hand. She'll give that to you. And uh, I realized, start the day humbly, uh, page one, the outline, I messed up. Um, when I was transcribing it for the notes, I uh, wrote the wrong thing on point three, where it says, our sinful flesh uses sin as an opportunity to sin. Just cross it out and put sleep. And then the same in four, our renewed heart uses sleep as an opportunity to glorify God. So just raise your hand if you need a handout. Um, the handout has the outline, and then I, I hope the, the last part of it is most helpful, which is, I'll explain it later, just a summary and a way to organize all that the Bible says on the topic of sleep. So this morning we are going to begin what's going to be at least two weeks, but as I'm going, it's going to be hard to get it into two uh, weeks study on the biblical theology of sleep. So since many of you have heard that this lesson is coming, I've received a number of questions and comments, like so many people said, I've never heard a sermon about sleep. How are you possibly going to fill an entire equipping hour with a topic like that? And I have no idea how I'm going to fit it into two or three. Um, some people have helpfully said, would it be rude if I fell asleep during your message? <laughs> but... Most, mostly it seems like people are very excited because we recognize that sleep is something that we do every day. It's important, and it's likely that we've all struggled with and fought for a proper understanding of sleep. So let me start by answering why I've chosen this topic. In short, it's, well, I, I think that we need to hear from God's word on this topic because God's word speaks to it. So my goal today and next week, and if we do any other weeks then as well, is to expose our heart to what God's word says about sleep so that we don't waste the opportunity to glorify God in our sleep. So since we're going to be opening up God's word together, I, I want to lead us in prayer. So let's clo close our eyes. Remember that we are speaking to the God who revealed himself to us in his word, who gave us his word, who created us and even gave us sleep for his glory. So God, we come to you now as humble, dependent creatures. God, I pray that our thoughts would be ordered after yours. Thank you for your word where we find truth God, my prayer for this morning is that I would accurately represent you and accurately represent your word. That I would not be a stumbling block in my weakness, but I would get out of the way and let the power of your word be unleashed on hearts. I pray that we would be better for being here. That we would think better about this gift of sleep that you give to your beloved. God, I pray that we would glorify you more. Our faith would be grown. That you would be worshipped and exalted in our hearts, recognized as the holy God that you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, I'll start with the autobiographical reasons why I'm interested in this topic. And I've given it a pretty good amount of study, and I'm excited to share some of that with you. I'll start in my teenage years through my 20s. Maybe some of you are like this. I prided myself in my arrogance on my ability to function without sleep or without sufficient sleep, so I thought. I often wore this as a badge of honor and would feel self-validation when I realized how many more productive hours I found each day for going to sleep than many of my peers. I have to say this was not a mark of wisdom or godly diligence. 
There were certainly times when I gave up sleep for good reasons, but in hindsight, most of the times when I ne- neglected God's good gift of sleep, it was a manifestation of my foolish, prideful self-sufficiency. And I believe this foolishness was a significant cause of the obesity and medical problems that developed through my 20s and 30s. Um, I see some new people coming in. If you do not have a handout, just raise your hand. Eliana will run that over to you. If you need a handout, just raise your hand. Then through my 30s, uh, my son David developed cancer. And I saw anxiety that I was previously unaware of raise itself sinfully in my heart, threatening to rob me of many nights sleep. I realized my need to start studying and thinking better on this topic as I lay sleepless next to my son's bed in the hospital. Then about four years ago, as many of you know, my own cancer developed. I often found myself sleepless due to that same struggle with anxiety, but also newfound struggles with an inability to sleep, whether it was due to pain, steroids, uh, the hypercortisolemia, and just other metabolic problems that ensued. And I found through that that as God sanctified me and taught me to trust in and rest in the way that he orders the universe, been sanctified through that, and I found that I sleep much better than I used to, and the quality and duration of my sleep is not nearly as affected by the tumults or circumstances I find myself in. I hope that my experience, but more importantly, God's word will help you have a similar peace and calm and sweetness to your sleep as a result of being here this morning. Autobiographically, another reason I'm interested here is I have a wife who has chronic pain, and she is regularly deprived of sleep due to that. I do not approach this topic simply or simplistically, but recognizing that for many, sleeplessness is something that you struggle with, struggle for contentment in each night for a variety of reasons, and God's word addresses these. Over the last few years, I saw my grandpa die of Alzheimer's disease, a disease that I know and am be, becoming increasingly aware of in the med- medical literature is actually exacerbated, sometimes caused, and certainly brought on earlier as a result of sleep deprivation. That's made me think on sleep. I have never really sweet job, nurse anesthesiologist. I regularly render people completely unconscious comatose using medications. I daily interact with the complex physiology of the brain and think about sleep and this brain and body that God's given us. And the more that I think about it, the more thankful I am for sleep and the more I want to worship the God who gave us this gift. So as I thought about a lot about sleep, I've tried first and most to keep my thinking tethered to Scripture. As I've searched God's word, I've found much help, much guidance, and more than a little bit of correction and admonishment regarding sleep. So in this packet, um, I've shared a, a document. It's, called a, it's just a passage list. It's not completely exhaustive, but it includes many of the passages in Scripture on sleep and my attempts at categorizing them. There's no possible way I'm going to get to cover all of these in this lesson, but I want this to serve as a helpful guide, helpful aid to you as you consider what the Bible says about sleep to see some of what um, I've seen as I've tried over the last months and years to think about and categorize all that the Bible says on the topic. Even as I've done that and reviewed it, just like on the front page, I've messed up. I've seen a few as I was trying to organize a few errors in categorization. I put passages in the wrong section. Some of those will be obvious, like under there's Jesus sleeps. In that section, I have one that should go a couple segments earlier. Just please forgive me and recognize the, uh, this is not a perfect document. Neither is it exhaustive, but I do pray that it would be helpful. 
ultimately, this equipping hour is a preaching to myself on this topic. And so you all get to listen in and benefit with me from some of what God's word has to say on the topic. And it has much to say. Honestly, when I started the study uh, years ago, I think I, I started with diligence in the middle of cancer. I was aware of it before. Um, I started with diligence. I was surprised by all that God's word had to say. I shouldn't have been. We spend one quarter to one third of our life. By the time we end our lives, it'll likely be about a third of your life that you spend completely unconscious. God designed it this way. And I believe he did it for some very specific, very gracious, and very important reasons. He created us to need sleep. This wasn't a design constraint, something, some necessary evil that he had to insert into us to, to make us work. Um, I think he designed us with the need to sleep, and he has some very specific purposes in that need. He is not silent on the topic of sleep. For the Christian, we are not living this short life on earth for life on this earth, right? What we have been given to do while we live here and now is eternally significant. So you might think that God said, let them pack as much into that short life on earth as they can as my people live to glorify me, but that is not the case. At least it actually is in every single thing that we do, whether we eat, drink, or sleep, we do it all to the glory of God. But God did not give us 24 hours each day to be productive. We do not have 24 hours each day to go about our, our business. And although some of us, each of us are slightly different, the reality is that we each need and function optimally with about eight hours of sleep every night. If you think you are not in this category, you would likely delude yourself. Let's silent that. So God has only given us 16 hours in each day to go about the business of life. And he has graciously given us eight hours each night in which we continue to glorify him, at least in which we have the opportunity to do so, as we are rendered unconscious by our God-created physiologic need for sleep. God did not give us sleep to keep us from the good works that he prepared for us. Rather, we know that the good works that he prepared for us must be constrained by the 16 hours average he gave us each day in which to live. So I want to start our study on biblical theology, where we should start all studies of biblical theology. We're going to start with God, and that's point one. Sleep is a reminder that we are creatures. To be compared with the incomparable God who is not a creature and does not need to sleep. God doesn't sleep. We must. Open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. That's where we're going to start today. Isaiah chapter 40. On our passage guide, on the, the passage list, you can see this is where I start there. God doesn't sleep. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. But we're going to take a running start at this verse and see it in the context of what God is communicating in this amazing chapter. So turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 40, and while you turn there, I'll summarize some of the content of this amazing chapter written to comfort God's exiled people in a foreign land. God comforts them by showing them his incomparable and surpassing greatness. You're going to see constantly throughout this chapter to what shall you compare me? There's nothing that you can compare me with, God says. And so ultimately, this is going to climax in our verses where God basically, I, I believe, reveals that sleep is a nightly reminder that God is God and we are creatures. And sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need 
and God's incomparable faithfulness, power, and strength. One, sleep is a nightly reminder that God is God and we are creatures. And two, sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need and of God's incomparable faithfulness, power, and strength. So God is without peer. There is no comparison, Isaiah 40 says, right? That's the repeated refrain, to whom will you then compare me? There is nobody that you can compare God to. Any comparisons reveal the stupidity of trying to compare God to anything. His power is incomparable, it says. His tender care for his own is without peer. His wisdom is inscrutable. His influence is without challenge. That's Isaiah 40, 1 through 11 in a nutshell. Then Isaiah 40, 12. Think about this. It says, he marks off the heavens with a span. Do you know what a span is? It's, it's like this. Take your, finger, your thumb and your finger, you sort of measure it, and you're like, oh, that, it's about, about that much. The light years of space are like this to God. Right? We, we would have to travel at the speed of light for our whole lifespan. And God's like, oh, I'll take a bunch of those, hook them all together and measure it just with my thumb and, and forefinger. He's incomparable. Isaiah continues demonstrating God's peerless power. He says, nations and all of their apparent power are insignificant in comparison to him. The gods of the nations are helpless idols ultimately crafted from the very things that Yahweh God created. They can't do anything. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Look down at verse 26. Isaiah 40, verse 26, as we're getting closer to our passage. It says, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. What do you think the these is in verse 26? It's if you're in the night sky in the ancient Middle East with no light, with none of this light pollution, you would look up and you would see countless stars. And they testify to God's creative power, right? Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We do not actually know how many stars there are in the universe. But even just considering the number is beyond humbling. There is somewhere between 100 to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And our galaxy is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that we know about. I'm, I, I don't do numbers that big. There are billions of billions, hundreds of billions of hundreds of billions, maybe even billions of trillions of stars in the universe. I can't comprehend that. And God doesn't just know how many stars there are. He knows them by name. And they appear by the greatness of his might. Continuing in verse 26, He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. We can't even count them. And even if we could, we can't fathom things that big. God knows how many there are because he made them and they come out and are sustained because he is strong in power. God is truly incomparable. And this crescendo of incomparables in Isaiah 40 continues to rise as we read on regarding this eternal, omnipotent, omniscient one. Verse 27 Right? God knows you can't hide. 
This God has no rivals. There is no one like him in all the universe, much less in all the earth. And now we finally arrive at the apex of this amazing chapter. And we arrive at our topic, sleep. Need for rest. God does not sleep. All creatures do. Isaiah 40, 28. God does not faint or grow weary. Sleep is a daily reminder that we ought not make the mistake of thinking of God in human categories. That we ought not make the mistake of trying to play God in our life. Even youths faint and will be weary But God does not faint or grow weary. It is a foolish endeavor to trust in your own strength when trusting in God's is an option. Sleep is a nightly reminder of that truth. And if you're like me, you're, I need reminders. I'm so thankful that God gives me this reminder, gives each of us this reminder each night that we are creatures and he is not. Just think about this. The human body, how pitiful we are by God's grace. The human body needs sleep more than we need food. People can survive a week or two without sleep but not very well. The world record for going without sleep, somewhere between 18 and 24 days. That's crazy. Uh, But it's so dangerous that the Guinness Book of World Records has actually banned people from trying to beat this record. They won't even consider changing it. It's that dangerous. And uh, one sleep scientist commented on that. They actually let people like see how far up in the atmosphere they can go on hot air balloons, like up to over 100,000 feet and jump out of them. They record those records. They won't let you try to beat the record on sleep or sleeplessness. Have you ever tried to pull an all-nighter? Remember how disabling that was. How you probably thought, I'm going to get a lot more done without sleeping. And how gloriously that backfired every single time. How pitiful. We fall apart with a few extra hours of sleeplessness than normal. But more humbling, perhaps, than the dramatic effects of a full night's loss of sleep is what happens with even one hour less sleep on one night of the year. Um, Thankfully, Arizona doesn't participate in this foolishness, but the rest of the country does. And in a national experiment every year, just to show what happens when humans get one hour less sleep, the clocks spring forward, right? Daylight savings time. And so in the spring, when daylight savings time cuts sleep short for many by just an hour, there is a documented and substantial increase in car accidents, increase in suicide attempts, even an increase in heart attacks. Lots more. I, I'm going to try to keep myself from just going off on like, I'm going to try to keep, uh, there's so much more I want to share about all this, but I'm going to try to keep pressing forward with God's word Sometime, I would love to, to deep dive on some of the benefits and, of sleep and harms of sleeplessness, but I'll keep going. We ought to be reminded of this theology lesson, that God is God. He does not sleep. We are creatures. We need sleep. We ought to be reminded of this theology lesson with each night's sleep. Don't go to sleep mindlessly and miss this opportunity. We must not fool ourselves into thinking that we can outrun the daily illustration of our creaturely weakness that God teaches us in our need for sleep. Every day, each of us must sleep. And if you don't sleep, you're not at your best. Poor focus, impaired memory, compromised thinking. Think about it. When you don't sleep, you're more prone to sin. 
little things threaten to become big anxiety trigger things in your mind. If you don't believe me, just think about what your kids do if they miss a nap. You're no better. Self-control becomes harder. Sober-minded reasoning is tougher. Prayerful vigilance is difficult. Diligence becomes even more arduous. When we make a lifelong pattern of not sleeping, we are at increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Our bodies pay the price. You're more likely to get sick. You're at an increased risk of diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure, and heart disease. You're fatter, weaker, less physically able to perform. All of this is incontrovertible. When you don't sleep, your chances of dying in a car accident or similar mishap increases dramatically. When ultimately, when we don't sleep, our lives tend to be cut shorter and we tend to be less effective and more disease riddled in the years that we have. We humans are weak. We must sleep can't escape this fact. It is a gracious reminder of God, of the very heart of theology. God's God, we're not. While we're awake, there's a chemical in our brain called adenosine. It builds up every day, starting with the minute you wake up, adenosine starts to build, generates this thing called sleep pressure on you that ultimately will win. It pressures you into sleep. It's responsible for that feeling you have when you know that you should be awake because you're driving your car to California and you just can't help but nod off. And you're like, if I fall asleep, I will die. And you still find yourself just fighting this pressure. It will win. There's a medication that many of you are familiar with, some of us love, that blocks adenosine. It's called caffeine. I'm grateful for it. But caffeine doesn't get rid of adenosine. It just blocks its effects temporarily. And adenosine will always win. But sleep doesn't merely exist to clear your brain of this chemical. Rather, the sleep, um, that chemical is a gracious warning to you that you need sleep because God designed you, he designed me, to be weak creatures that need sleep. I believe he did so to remind us, like I said, that we are creatures and he is God. Just think for a second, and then I'll get back to the text, of some of the benefits to our body, the gracious benefits. God didn't just design sleep as this mean thing to keep us from being productive. He actually, we'll see, designed it as a gracious means and expression of trust in him. But he also design some pretty incredible things to happen while you're unconscious. Our brains actually have a septic system called a glymphatic system that flushes disease-causing toxins from your brain. When you enter deep sleep, your brain actually shrinks in size, and like the channels filled with fluid increase, and it just flushes those toxins out. Tiredness is a warning that you need need that that cleaning and rejuvenation. When you're asleep, your immune system is supported, oxidative stress is decreased, cellular damage is repaired, your bodies and minds are rejuvenated. During sleep, our memories are actually downloaded to long-term storage. You can only store so many memories in your hippocampus. That fills up. At night, you actually offload those to your long-term storage in your cortex. It's amazing. Learning is augmented. Thinking is refined. While you sleep, your muscles are repaired and your bodies are sharpened. I want to go into more, but I'll I'll stop. Just suffice it to say that we were designed to need sleep. God doesn't have any of these needs. Sleep does good things for us. Without sleep, we get sicker, weaker, and we die earlier. But God does not rest because he does not need to. He doesn't need refreshment. God does not get tired We are not God. I know that is really obvious when you're sitting here in church, but how many times do you actually try to play God in your heart and mind? How many times do you think, uh, God, I actually 
would prefer if I was in charge. I want to do it my way. I can't go to sleep now because I have too much to do, too much to think about. I have work left undone. Ultimately, it doesn't matter whether we want to sleep or not. No matter how hard you try to stay awake, no matter how young, vigorous, how genetically superior you think you are from others, you need to sleep. You and I will grow weary. We will tire and sleep will win. We will be rendered unconscious, helpless, and vulnerable, no matter how powerful you think you are. But God is never unconscious. He is always in perfect control. He will never grow faint or weary. He's incomparable. Sleep is a nightly reminder that God is God and we are creatures. In each time in Scripture that God proclaims the fact that he does not sleep, it is paired in near context with the instruction that his people ought to find their strength in him through trusting God faith. And that's how Isaiah 40 ends. Remember our point two, sleep is a nightly demonstration, uh, under point one, but sleep is a nightly reminder that God is God, we're creatures, and sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need in God's incomparable faithfulness, power, and strength. We're still under point one on the outline. The solution to our weak and weary prone state is not to trust in our own power, but to look to, rely on, and trust in the one who never grows weary or faint, the God who never sleeps. We don't find the power to live for God's glory by looking within or by trying harder, but ultimately looking to him. It says, in, as we go on, Isaiah 40, he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases in strength. And to the one who has no might, he increases in strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wing, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, shall walk and not faint. Not because God relieves them of their need for sleep, because they're no longer trusting in their own power, but in his. We do not find strength when we delude ourselves that we are powerful like God, but rather when we recognize the truth of what sleep proclaims to us each night. God is God and we are not. Our incessant, never-ending, everyday need for sleep can be thought of, I think, like Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, sent to keep us from becoming conceited to keep us from looking within for power, but rather to force us to look to the incomparable God of the universe who said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, we can say that we are content. Even embrace your nightly requirement for seven to eight hours of sleep because God does not sleep or slumber. For when I am weak, I'm strong in him. Now let's turn to the other foundational text for this point one. It's Psalm 121. Let's start reading together and then get ready to underline two phrases in verses three and four. Psalm starts in verse one. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from Yahweh who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved because he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Each night as you go to bed, you and I ought to say with the psalmist, he who keeps me will not slumber. Yahweh is my keeper. I really want to put this verse above my bed to remind me every night when I climb into bed. He who keeps you will not slumber. I must slumber. God will not. I'm convinced that this need for sleep is not part of the fall. 
though our proclivity to abuse it and forsake it and then suffer all the resultant consequences is. God didn't make us, or God didn't have to make us with a need for sleep, but he did. And just like all of his purposes, sleep was designed for his glory and our good. Sleep was designed by God to direct us to trust him and not trust in ourselves. That is a wise direction and daily reminder from our loving God. Sleep is actually one of the parts of God's good self-revelatory creation. The passage we're so familiar with that we reference often in Romans 1, 18 through 23 I think sleep is part of that creation that testifies to who God is so that no man is without excuse. Our need for sleep screams at us every night that there is a creator unlike us who does not sleep and we are not like him. There is one unlike us, as Colossians 1 says, by whom and for whom all things were made and in whom all things hold together. That one must be different than us because that one doesn't sleep and the universe keeps going on. Consider the declarations of sleep that we've considered from Isaiah 40 as we read Romans 1, 19. I'll I'll read it to you. For what can be known about God is plain to all men because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. All of creation and sleep, I believe, in particular declare, we are not God, but there is a God. And inherent in that declaration is the conclusion that we ought to honor him as God trusting him and not ourselves. Just as it says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals, creeping things, all impotent things that ultimately um, can't do anything while God sustains the universe and does not sleep. Some may mistake God's patience for inactivity. Time magazine famously asked, remember, is God dead? And Nietzsche arrogantly declared, God is dead. Old Testament writers even pleaded with God to wake up when they couldn't clearly see him at work. Like in Psalm 44, 23, it's prayed, Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. They described his return to fight for Israel in Psalm 78, 65 as awakening from sleep. But the reality is that God was never asleep. He's patient. Sometimes his time isn't ours. Sometimes, like we learned last week from Smed in in, uh, evening service, there are cosmic things going on behind the scenes that we're not privy to. God is active even when we can't see it. The reality is that he who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber. And we ought not mistake God's patience when we can't see him at work with God being asleep or idle. Turn to 2 Peter 2, 3. This is another passage that I believe refers to God not being asleep, but rather than God not being asleep while he is working for his people, this is a different aspect of God not sleeping. For those who deny Christ, their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. 
even if it's delayed. Do not overlook the fact that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The God who does not sleep sees all and will return with all his power to burn up this creation in judgment. And if you trust in Jesus, the one who keeps you will not slumber. But for those who reject Jesus, your destruction is not asleep. So don't waste bedtime each night. Bedtime is a clear reminder that we must not miss. We are creatures. God is God. God is incomparable in power, might, stamina, and ultimately glory. Praise him for it. And do not go to bed tonight. Indeed, let's now resolve to never go to bed again without marveling at God's incomparable power. And then let's marvel some more. What did God, the creator, sustainer, never sleeping God who needs nothing do with his incomparable power? Philippians 2.5. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, a slave, being born in likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. God the Son, the eternal second person of the Trinity, who is God, was in the beginning with God and through whom all things were made. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, humbled himself, and was born a man. The creator, being a creature, humbled himself. And Jesus slept. He created himself with the need for sleep while he was in human form. Sleep is humiliating. Sleep is humbling. All humans, no matter how rich, powerful, poor, or weak, are humbled by the nightly need for sleep. And in love, Jesus emptied himself, taking this fleshly form. He had to eat, he had to drink, he had to breathe. And each night, despite his eternal power, Jesus demonstrated his humility as he peacefully rested and slept. Jesus then went on to humble himself still more. Philippians 2.8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So each night, when we are forced by our need as creatures to sleep, Don't forget that God is God. And in his power, he does not need to sleep. And how comforting that he demonstrated irrefutably in his humble, sacrificial life and death for us on the cross that he uses all that power while we're awake or while we are asleep to rule the universe for our good and his glory. Jesus humbling himself and needing to sleep should prove irrefutably to your heart that God in all of his power is good, will work for your good and for his glory. What good news that we as Christians can rest in each night while we sleep. I'll end this section and transition to the next with some words from John Piper that I can't improve upon. He writes, sleep is a daily reminder from God, that we are not God. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep, but we will. Once a day, God sends us to bed like patients with a sickness. The sickness is a chronic tendency to think that we are in control and that our work is indispensable. To cure us of this disease God turns us into helpless sacks of sand once a day. How humiliating to the self-made corporate executive that has to give up all control and become as limp as a suckling infant every day. Sleep is a parable that God is God, and we are mere men. God handles the world quite nicely while a hemisphere sleeps. Sleep is like a broken record that comes around with the same message every day. Man is not sovereign. 
Man is not sovereign. Man is not sovereign. Every day for your entire life. What a gracious message. Piper goes on to say, don't let this lesson be lost on you. God wants to be trusted as the great worker who never tires and never sleeps. He is not nearly so impressed with our late nights and early mornings as he is with the peaceful trust that casts all anxieties on him and sleeps. And that brings us to point two. Sleep is an opportunity to humbly, dependently trust God. Sleep each night is a small but very real act of faith. Each night when you fall asleep, it's an opportunity to preach the gospel to yourself and to trust in the God who will not sleep. My sins have been forgiven. I do not fear death or wrath. God is in control while I clearly am not. So I will gladly embrace my creaturely need for sleep and entrust myself to the trustworthy one who never tires or sleeps. Let's think again on Jesus sleeping. The times in the gospel when we hear of him sleeping are two. They're in the boat in the middle of the storm that had his disciples fearing for their lives. Luke 8, 23, as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. In Mark 4, 38, the waves were breaking in the boat, but Jesus was asleep in the stern. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And after rebuking the wind and calming the sea with his words, he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? I told you earlier that one of the reasons I decided to embark on this study was because of seasons in my life where sleep was hard to come by. I found my body exhausted at night. My mind was wide awake, filled with sinful anxiety, thinking about things over which I had no control. Fighting God in my heart, trying to wrest control of the universe from him. Will my son's body, or cancer-wracked body survive this night? Will my family be provided for if I die? And honestly, probably like you, I found myself awake at night thinking about more mundane things, like stresses from interpersonal relationships, uncertainties at work, politics, family dynamics, countless other things my sinful heart fights to control. That's what anxiety is, right? It's an expression of dissatisfaction and distrust in God's rule of the universe. So in our foolish impotence, we lie awake at night, anxious. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? I even get anxious about how I'm going to function without the sleep I just lost in my anxiety. Jesus' words in Matthew 6 are so comforting. He says, don't be like those who don't know God, who seek after these very same things, finding themselves lying awake at night, anxious. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, all the things that you need, including sleep. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Today is today. God is in control. Tomorrow is tomorrow. God will be in control. In between today and tomorrow... God ordained that you must sleep. And I must embrace that sweet gift that God gives to his beloved while he rules the universe in my mental absence. Sleep each night is a small but very real act of faith. The ultimate, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting of all your anxieties on him, knowing that he cares for you. Right? Everybody in the world sleeps, whether you're Christian or not. But only, that's just a common grace. But only Christians get to experience that peace of sleep that surpasses all comprehension, that guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Open your Bibles to Psalm 4.8. We'll end on this 
point. Don't worry, there's lots more. I want to hear David's amazing testimony of the sleep that he found in the midst of distress. This was not easy sleep, but he, it was found by preaching truth to his heart on his bed. Verse 4, if you look at Psalm 4, sorry, I'm getting there. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds. Be silent. He's fighting to trust Yahweh. Perhaps David wrote this psalm while hiding in a cave in the wilderness while Saul and his armies were unjustly seeking for his life. It's obvious he wrote it in a time of crisis with false accusations being made against him. And God recorded David's words here, not to make us look up to David as if he's a big deal, but to, like David, move us toward trust in God that would lead us to sleep, like David did. Psalm 4, 8. David writes, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. Right, Jesus could lie down and sleep in the stern of the boat because he knew that God the Father ruled the storm. David could lie down and sleep while wicked men spewed lies against him and sought his life. Why? Because it goes on in verse 8, You alone, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. David did what he could to be safe. Right? He wasn't passive or foolish, sleeping out in the middle of, of the open so that those who sought his life could kill him. He, he hid in caves. He brought his faithful men with him. They stood guard. But then when it was time to sleep, David didn't ultimately trust in the cave or the men, the wisdom of his hiding spot or the plan. He trusts in Yahweh who alone could make him dwell in safety. Let me give you a glimpse into my own struggles and peace that this psalm has brought me. I hope it's an encouragement to you for the peace that you can find. I'll share an excerpt from a prayer that I wrote late at night in pain in the hospital bed out at Banner MD Anderson. Um knowing that the next morning I would undergo another round of chemo injected into my bloodstream and around my brain. This isn't to make much of me, but but it is an encouragement of how we must not miss the opportunity for sleep, even when very real danger and trials threaten the night's sleep that God ordained for you to enjoy. I was tempted to read more about the statistics and chances for survival of those in my situation, thinking about how God would provide for my wife if I died, fearful of the pain that I knew would come. Honestly, I I remember that night I didn't trust my nurse. She wasn't very good. I was in constant fear that there was going to be a med error. There was a lot of things trying to keep me awake. And here's what I prayed on my bed. This is, sometimes when I have a hard time praying, I write it out. It's helpful to keep your thoughts straight. And this is what I wrote. I said, I paired it with this verse in my Bible. I said, God, you know that I am not looking forward to starting this next cycle of chemo tomorrow. Honestly, I'm scared. I'm scared of the side effects and the pain. My mind is prone to think continually about what else we should be doing. Is this enough? Will this work? What happens if this doesn't work? I don't know if I can endure another cycle of the pain, but you don't call me to endure all of it at once. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but you do, and I trust you. In peace, make me to lie down and sleep. If I survive tonight or survive this at all, it's not ultimately dependent on me. This chemo, these doctors, or anything else, what happens tomorrow is from you. What's going on right now is from you, and you love me. So God, make me lie down tonight in peace. Make Kiki to lie down in peace, alone in our bed at home. We trust you to keep us safe and do, and to do what is right. David, surrounded by enemies trying to kill him, 
You hear the same prayer in Psalm 3 that we're going to start with next week. Though thousands surround him and threaten to take his life, he will not fear. So whether we live or die, we're with the Lord. Sleep, and, and ultimately whether you live or die, is not ultimately up to you, but it's up to the Lord. Sleep is a small and very real act of faith. Each night as a child falls asleep, it's an oper- as God's child, as you and I fall asleep, it's an opportunity to preach the gospel to ourselves and trust in God who controls it all. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with us, with also graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. So regardless of what God does with our lives, circumstances, or the universe while we're unconscious, nothing will be able to separate you or me, if you're a believer, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So with David, we must shepherd our hearts to trust in God and say, as we are preparing to sleep, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Yahweh, O Yahweh, make me dwell in safety. Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He who keeps you will not slumber, even while we do. Let's pray. God, you are God, we are not. I know your word has much more to say about sleep, but I wanted to stay here, hammer this point home to my heart. You are a trustworthy God and we can express faith, trust in you by embracing sleep and not missing the chance to learn the lessons that you intend for us in it. God, I pray uh, for our hearts that each night this week you would make us to preach the gospel to ourselves and declare this foundational theological truth to ourselves as we lay down and pursue this gift of sleep. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.